response simply was, that's what a neighbor does. Even though these people don't speak to me, most of them, they're not very neighborly. But do we choose how to be based on how others are acting? Or do we choose to act simply because we know who we are? Now, the funny thing is, so I started going to stuff, you know, shoveling snow or whatever, and then one neighbor would come out and they joined in, and then another neighbor came out and they joined in, and it turned into this snow shoveling party where everybody was shoveling snow everywhere and cleaning other people's cars and all of this stuff. And it was one of the few times that as a neighborhood, we actually came together. We laughed and joked and... People we, whose names we didn't know was like, hey, so what's your name? I see you all the time. And, but had Ray opted not to break the mold of conformity, would that have happened? It's never happened before. And it hasn't happened since, except when Ray goes outside and starts the ball rolling. So here we are in this month. The month of February, which is also Black History Month. And my mind is, you know, rummaging and, you know, about this whole thing of. So, anybody know the theme for the month? I can't read it. I can look. I can't read. Trish, go ahead. <laughs> Seeking the common good, right? So, the theme for the month is seeking the common good. And today's specific one is, what is the common good? What does that mean? But my mind is, you know, thinking about this whole idea of, well, what does it mean for us to be religious scientists? What does it mean for us to practice new thought? What does it mean for us to take the spiritual philosophy that we say we know works, that we say we believe in, we say this stuff, and on one hand, it's great Great. But on the other hand, when it comes down to the real nitty gritty of stuff, I'm not seeing enough of us walking the walk. And I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. There are challenges within watching the news and hearing about the day of Upper in Virginia. Blackface. School in Montgomery County. Teens had handing out uh, tickets based off of Willy Wonka that say you get to say the N word without any kind of repercussions if you have the ticket in hand. You have another school, I want to say Loudoun County, but I could be wrong, where part of their gym exercising is. Let's, let's play Runaway Slave. Here's the obstacle course. It's the year 2019. And yet day after day after day, there is something in the news referencing sexism, ableism, homophobia, Islamophobia, something. There was a gentleman don't remember where he was, but because it was a store and the gentleman who was shopping thought the man who was a Sikh thought he was Muslim, and so he threw hot coffee on him and punched him. For no other reason than he made the assumption that he was Muslim. Turn on the news at any given day, and there is enough evidence that says Love is the furthest thing. Being neighborly is the furthest thing. Common good? Furthest thing from the consciousness of men and women, leaders, etc., on the face of this planet. And here we come to our teaching. And there are folks who none of that stuff exists. I remember what Frank said, that there, there's the looking at what things are. Is this a wall? Yes. But it is so much more than just a wall. Because even this, and I'm not even talking about the divine aspect of it. I'm talking about this is more than just a wall. 
it's wood, it's plaster, it's nails, it's paint. It's the chemical compound that goes into the paint. It is so much more than just A. Even a garment, it's far more than just the garment because the energy of the men and women who grew and gathered and weaved and transported and sold and the energy of all that goes into it. So it's still not just a garment. But it's easy for us to see it because for linguistic convenience, we're going to name something real quick for what it is. Very quick and easy. What is it? It's a shirt. What is it? Pants. What is it? It's a wall. If I go through, well, it's a 10 by 12 structure made of, I'm going to get bored, I'm going to get tired, like, oh great, I got a bus to catch. <laughs> it's a wall. Let's move on. So there is the element of linguistic convenience that we do this for. I got that. But there's a time and a place where people in our teaching, people in new thought say racism doesn't exist, sexism doesn't exist, because it doesn't exist in God. It doesn't exist for God. God doesn't experience it. Yes and no. Because if Ernest Holmes' words are true, God in you, as you, is you, then doesn't that mean every experience you have is God having that experience? So if you are a woman who experiences sexism, as you, did you or did you not experience, God knows what sexism feels like. In the temporal. Not in the infinite, but in the right here and now. Doesn't God know what that feels like? So then why bypass and say it doesn't exist? Why not ask ourselves, what is mine to do in stepping higher? What is mine to do regarding this teaching to move to a higher level of awareness, a higher level of being in the world so that this light, this love, this power is becoming this radiating force changing and transforming the world? One reason we don't do it is because it's too much to ask. It's a lot of responsibility. When you start thinking, it's your job to change the world. No, but it is your job to change your world. What did Mother Teresa say about cleaning the entire world? No, if everybody just took their broom and went out to their own front porch, and everybody took responsibility to sweep just in front of your own home, then the entire world would be clean. But how many of us are doing that? How many of us are going into that place in our consciousness where anything and everything but oneness, but common good exists? Find those places, shine light on it. And, and let me give you a quick pyramid uh, off of it. So what is, what is the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do unto others like you want people to do to you. But what if you don't know what you want people to do to you? For example, what if you've been so abused, so beaten, that you don't know what love is, so clearly you're going to want others to give you what you're used to. I'm used to being abused. So I'm going to treat others in a manner that's going to give me what I'm accustomed to. Okay. But do we know ourselves well enough to know that that's where we're operating from? Because if we talk about this common good, like the good for every man and woman in the room, what do we need to do for that? Yeah, but do I do what is the common good for this? Meaning, do I take accountability for me and being a good steward of this body temple, of this mind, of this heart, of my relationships? Am I being a good steward for the common good of Ray? Because there is no way that Ray is really, 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 really going to do what he can do at most and best for Alan if he is not doing his most and best for himself. I can't give him anything to drink out of an empty cup. So do I know enough about me to know where I'm operating from, to know what I need to do for my own good, to then be able to share and shine and infect that out into the world. Did anybody know that there's an author by the name of Mitch Horowitz? You know the name? So Mitch Horowitz, author, teacher, lecturer, 
there are two particular books that I'm referencing. One, the Definite Chief Aim and Miracle Club, where he references Napoleon Hill. You know Napoleon Hill? Where do you know Napoleon Hill from? Thank you, Brother Rich. Okay, that was a test question. I might have to give you more difficult questions. Okay, so, Think and Grow Rich. Well, in Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill mentions the Golden Rule. And he says, but we're missing a very important element of it. We think, do unto others. Do. Do. Do unto others. But he doesn't. He said, we, what we don't do is we don't go to the how you think about others. The energy of cause and effect. So if I am thinking angry thoughts about somebody else, if I am thinking bitterness, if I am thinking jealousy, if I am thinking anything but that which is the common good, then am I not first putting in the garden of my mind the very poisons that I am then going to make bread from, that I am then trying to serve somebody else? Like, I'm the one growing it first. So, I can't do if there isn't first a uh, think. Right? Like, even when we're not, I'm not consciously saying left foot, right foot. Like, I'm not consciously thinking about it. But there's a part of me that is on autopilot that says, you know, walk, move, because that's what you do as an animated cartoon. Just move. So we move. But we know that I couldn't do that if there wasn't first a mental stimulus to make that happen, correct? So clearly, everything we are doing starts with a thought somewhere. So even if I am doing unto others as I believe I am supposed to do, for that is what we holy people do, somewhere back there there is the mask of bitterness and anger and why am I always the one that has to do this stuff? Nobody, nobody shovels our snow first. Hey, neighbor, hey, let me help you. That's called hypocrisy. Is that really the energy that we want to be operating from? Or do we want to find a place where we truly know what it means to feel good, to plant good, to operate from a place of goodness, knowing that if I love me. If I lived next door to me, I would love being my neighbor. That I really, really appreciate who I am with all of the baggage and all of the mistakes and all of the stuff that's like, mm. if I knew better, I would have done better, but I knew what I knew then and I operated from what I knew then and I get to operate from what I know now. What I know now is a new way of being. Are we willing to do the difficult work that it takes? Is it easy learning to play a musical instrument? Like, can anybody just sit down and do what you do? No. Can anyone just sit down, take a microphone in hand, even though a lot of people think they can, because there's a whole bunch of people with hairbrushes in their hands, thinking they share, but not everybody can do what you do. It took training to become someone who can sit down in front of that thing and play. Who can look at a sheet of dots and lines and squiggles and translate it to something that she then hears and she gets in harmony with, uses the vocal cords, the lips, the tongue, and gives this into the air, the vibration of, that hits these eardrums, that moves, moves our emotions, that strengthens our heart, that causes tears to move, a foot to tap, and legs to dance. Mastery. Are we willing to do the same thing for our spiritual practice, though? Are we willing to? We understand that there are practitioners who are trained, who take classes, who, like, this is their thing. For years, train and learn and pray and train and train and learn and pray. But everyone in here is a practitioner as well. You may not have a license. There, there's a song that's often sung in unity. Our thoughts are prayers. And we are always praying. Our thoughts are prayers and we are always praying. Be mindful of what you're saying. Seek a higher consciousness. 
Is that what we're doing? Every day we have the opportunity to turn on the news and choose to find or see the good, even in the midst of. We all know the story about the, the young girl who goes into the room and sees a pile of doo-doo, and she's all happy. She's like, oh! And they're like, why are you so happy? She's like, as if there's this big pile of, then there has to be a pony somewhere. <laughs> are we willing to say that when we see all of this stuff bubbling up, that it's bubbling up for a reason? That it's bubbling up for us to be able to apply what we know of love and law to this situation. Ernest Holmes in Science of Mind magazine, 1952, says, it is our simple and sincere conviction that if millions of people were, were affirmatively praying every day for our nation and for our leaders, spiritual powers would be loosed across the country which would impel it into right action. America is the great dream of the ages. Let us keep this dream fresh and fair in our minds and through our united faith, create a spirit of unity and solidarity against which the waves of disruption beat in vain. Hate cannot drive out hate. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Are we willing to step forward in this day and age and be willing to find anywhere within us that hate exists in any form that it exists in. Because even if someone were to say, which I have said in the past, oh, I hate my job. I hate waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go teach these ungrateful children who do nothing but give me problems, who I'm trying to teach you about Pierre Montreal and Michael De Michael. Michelangelo and Da Vinci and why are you giving me such hard problems and I wish your parents would just teach you because it's not that difficult. Ah! Is it any wonder I ended up with an ulcer? <laughs> like for real, is it any wonder that migraines and an ulcer is what my body demonstrated? So it's one thing to say it and we say once again with linguistic convenience, I got that, but how often do we sit down and for real, for real, sit with the idea of my body, so that which is my physical self, my mental, intellectual self, my relationships, my finances, my spiritual self, in all of these areas, am I demonstrating a superior level of mastery to show that I am a good steward? Do I take care of my friendships? Do I take care of the bonds that I have? Do I take care of my home and my car? If we were to go outside right now and look into anyone's vehicle, if the external is a demonstration of the internal, what would we see represented? No judgment, but a thing to actually question. If my desk is a reflection of what's in my mind, and Tracy says, hey doc, where's your stapler? And I'm like, I know it was here. Let me move some papers and let me move some books and some socks and some shoes and this, I don't even know what that is, and take a lizard. How do you get a lizard? <laughs> and I finally get to the desk. It's in the kitchen on top of the refrigerator. <laughs> like, is that a reflection of my consciousness in some way that I don't know, if I don't know where things are, do I not know where God is? Just a question. Do I know where Ray and that which God is? Do I know where they meet? Because if I ask you, where is the border between Arlington and Falls Church? You may know. You may, oh, that's such and such road. That's where the, that's the border. Very clear. Do you know where the intersection of, oh yeah, that's very clear. Do you know where the intersection of your humanity and your divinity are? So that you know when you are operating more from your human self or ego self or whatever vibrational self and your higher vibrational self, your self that knows that even though I am in this body and I feel anger and pain and 
frustration, even though I feel it, because I know what I am, I am never that thing. Meaning, there is a difference to say, I am angry today. I'm angry with you today. I feel angry about what happened between us Monday. It's a completely different energy. I am angry. Am I? Because what I am generally doesn't change. Like I don't wake up one morning and I notice, oh snap, I'm a middle-aged white woman today. <laughs> Let me go get a credit card. <laughs> but there is never, there is never a moment where what I am changes. Y'all wish the weapon. There's never a moment where what I am changes. But am I claiming that same kind of ownership over my illnesses? Because I'm making them mine. You know, my migraines are so bad this week. Oh, they're your migraines? They're not simply an experience of migraines. They're yours. Because what is ours, we, we protect. We protect my children. My home, my car, my, we protect it. So do you really want to lay the claim of my migraines, my ulcers, my illness, my disease, my anger, my bitterness, my racism, my whatever it is, do we really want to continue to hold and harbor the consciousness of it? Because for as long as we do, the common good will never be expressed. A world that works for all will never be expressed as an actual lived experience by the masses on this planet until we hit a critical mass that each and every individual one of us chooses to rise up. And rise up in the same way that folks did in the civil rights. And I'm not saying that everyone marches. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that Martin Luther King Jr. knew that some people could march and some people couldn't because they tested folks. Stand there. And if they saw someone ball up their fist, thank you, you'll be, you'll be doing it once. <laughs> like they knew, you can't go out there. Because for whatever reason, you, envelopes, phone calls, prayer, that's yours to do. So what I'm saying is, with the same level of clarity of purpose, I know what is mine to do. Are we willing to shift the consciousness and stand up? Are we willing to demand an entirely different level of excellence of our own lives? So that from the moment we wake up, that even when we feel frustrated, we know that there is still that infinite happiness and joy and love and power and peace that is always the undercurrent, that is always Fueling. Because we're not breathing. We're not consciously like breathe. Inhale. <gasps> Exhale. Because if I lost the stapler, trust and believe, I'm going to forget the. Uh. But we know that there is that intelligence that is the universe itself breathing us. And not just breathing us, but breathing itself as us. Are we ready to tap in and know? that we are far more powerful, far more loving, far more wise and capable than we may be able to see in this moment. Because understand that the 10-year-old you wouldn't have been able to see the you that you are now. <clears throat> the early versions don't see the evolved versions. So understand that there is a version of us that exists right now in the mind of God. There is how many minds? There is one mind. Fill in the blank. There is one mind. That mind is God's mind. That mind is... My mind. No. Give me a quality of that mind. <laughs> that mind is infinite. That mind is love. That mind is... Peace. Joy. Passion. Passion. One more. Humility, Humility and... And that mind is my mind now. Tapping into that on a regular, daily basis is what is going to shift the energy in our own lives because that's the common good. 
Because what is good for the goose is not good for the gander. We understand men, Mars, women, Venus, blah, 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 blah. What is good for me is not good for her. We are two different individual beings. We don't like the same foods. We may not like the same desserts. Like we're different. So what is good for me is not good for her. But what is spiritually good as beauty, joy, love, peace, that. Let's tap into that on a more regular basis. Then we won't have to seek the common good. We'll be walking the walk of the common good. We won't have to ask, well, what is the common good? Because we will be breathing that which is the common good. We will see it with our eyes, feel it with our hearts. We will move our hands and bring it into the world that everything we step on, we understand is hollow ground. That's what's the common good. Let us pray. Anchoring into this breath. Simply allowing the body to do what the body already knows how to do with the inhale and the exhale, that process of respiration knowing that in this breath we surrender and we allow the universe to do what it is doing, breathing itself as us, with no worry or concern with where the next breath will come from. We simply breathe. With no worry or attachment to where the last breath went, we simply breathe. And so from this place of allowing and surrender, I speak what I know. God in me, as me, is me. I speak this with such clarity that I begin this prayer, this treatment from the end. Amen. Amen that God is all there is. Amen that that which it is, I am. Amen that I know that that which I am is not simply what I am, but it is what all in this room are. God, infinite intelligence, present in, through, and as. Everyone in this room, everyone in this building, this city, this country, and beyond, God is all there is, infinite spirit, love, a consciousness that is ever expanding and growing and creating, that which it is, is right here where I am. Amen that I feel joy and gratitude, not simply to be able to, quote unquote, affirm this, but to declare it. To declare it in such a way that what I say is a command of the universe to demonstrate its solidarity for itself as a demonstration in my life. A command that the universe now demonstrates to me its conspiracy for its own good as my life. Amen that that conspiracy and that alignment and that coherent power and presence is the same power, same presence, same alignment for everyone in this room. There is not a single spot where God is not. From the top of my head to the soles of my feet, all God and all good. From the surface of my skin to the deepest particles of quantum matter, waves and energy, God is all there is. Amen that I know these are not my words, but that these are the words of the infinite I am, speaking about itself, through itself, and now placing these words back into the law of itself, the law that said yes before we gathered this morning, the law that has been saying yes throughout this service, and the law that will continue to say yes, because that is what the law does, yes. Yes, yes, and more yes. And so what I know is that all of this, and every idea we have in mind is already in the mind of God because there is but one mind. And in the mind of God it is already done, it is already formed, it is already functioning. And so by the power of this prayer, this declaration, and this command, I now anchor in the truth of this knowing that what is in the mind of God in the realm of spirit, right here and right now, shows itself in the realm and the experience of that which is material, that which is substance, and that which is our lived life experiences. I know it is already done. I know it is so. And so together we affirm, we declare, and we command this new level of awareness by saying together, and so it is.